Hi again, Mark here from TalkingBase.net. This week I'm going to be giving some pointers to those of you out there that might be finding it a little tricky getting into improvising. Okay, so I often hear people asking questions about how to solo or improvise on bass, and it's a pretty tricky thing to address without either getting all philosophical about the nature of creativity, or at the other end of the spectrum just uh, showing that person a bunch of licks, scales, arpeggios and mechanical things to practice without giving them any indication of how to apply them. Musical improvisation is basically spontaneous composition and when you improvise you become a composer as well as a performer and interpreter. So in studying improvisation we're studying composition but just in a very visceral way. Because we don't have the advantage of time in developing an idea we have to approach it more like a conversation. We have a language, in our case tonal music, and over time develop a vocabulary that we can then employ to express ourselves in whatever way we feel. The more we converse with or just observe others in normal conversation, the more we pick up different phrases, inflections, jokes and just plain sounds that we can then assimilate and use in our own speech. And there's no shame in this, it's just the way we learn. So the first thing that we have to do is listen to others and actually get a feel for how other people talk in their improvisation. Once we learn enough language to get by, we can start to play with the uh, words in our own way and eventually have conversations with other people. That's why one of the ultimate ways to learn to improvise and just play music in general is through playing with others. Jam sessions, band practice, exchanging licks with a friend, it's all essential in developing your vocabulary and style and the better musicians that you play with, the better. So first things first, just listen. Listen to all the great improvisers of jazz and blues like Charlie Parker, John Coltrane and Miles Davis and also listen to not so great improvisers. Any playing that you can get your hands on you can learn something from. Compare how people approach solos, not just the note choices but the phrasing, the rhythms, the space, the dynamics, the overall landscape. All of these things are important in improvising. But we have to start somewhere and I'm going to avoid just giving you a bunch of licks to learn. I think it's more important to help you gain an ability that allows you to construct your own ideas and dissect the ideas of others. One simple phrase can be a springboard for a whole bunch of musical ideas if you can take that idea and really take it apart, otherwise it's just another lick. So first of all I'm going to address a problem that many people have and I found to be a problem for myself when I first started. When people learn improvisation they're often told by teachers and other players that you need to develop your ear and oral skills. That way you can develop the ability to instantly transfer any idea that you have in your musical mind onto your instrument. And that's great advice. But what if nothing's springing to mind? And I don't just mean in terms of licks. I mean, what if your mind is not cooperating and no matter how hard you try, no melody is coming to mind? You can have perfect pitch, but if there's nothing in there, then you're not going to be transferring anything. This kind of musical writer block can uh, hit anyone but as a beginning improviser it's really common and often comes from insecurity problems especially when playing in front of other people. It doesn't take much to make you clam up. Uh, you can be wondering all these things like is this right? Is this what I'm supposed to be playing? When you should actually be working to shed all those thoughts to allow a pure voice to cut through. No matter how inexperienced and how little knowledge of all the theory things that you have it's still possible to make a small statement. So one important thing to try and develop first of all is your inner musical ear and mind uh, and as I said before this is where that philosophical side of improv can rear its head and I'm not going to get too far into that apart from to say that one way to work on this is to just spend a lot of time listening to music and coming up with your own melodies or counter melodies over that music. I don't mean crazy jazz lines, I just mean simple melodic lines. Listen to the vocal or instrumental melody and make up your own over the same song backing, all in your head or with your voice, or you can do it away from any recorded music. Just try to imagine melodies in your head, sing them to yourself, just try and be creative and imagine whatever music you can. Make up songs, make up bass lines, make up guitar riffs, anything to breed some creativity. If you have nothing inside then don't expect to be pulling off anything on the outside. Next, learn melodies on bass. We spend so long learning bass lines that when it comes to time uh, for us to take a solo or perform any kind of melodic feature, it just isn't as natural as let's say a sax player or any instrument that deals predominantly with melody. So learn the melodies to songs and by learning melodies on the instrument you get a feel for how melodies work and how they move around in relation to, uh, to the chords. This is all vital stuff in developing that musical ear that we were talking about. I mean, ask any musician that plays a melodic instrument for a living how to play something as seemingly simple as this and I guess 
guarantee that even if they're too cool to admit that they've been playing that on a gig, I guarantee that they'll be able to play it first time accurately by ear. So just start paying more attention to melody and practice playing melodies of your favourite songs off the top of your head. Also, try to take notice of all that other stuff that I talked about, like dynamics and rhythms and phrasing. Singers very rarely sing songs in a metronomically quantized manner like a computer. They use rhythm and dynamics to reinforce the expression of the particular lyric. Take a melody like And I Love Her by The Beatles. If I was to play the melody as it'd be written in a sheet music book, it'd probably sound something like this. Now let's mess around with the dynamics and the phrasing just a little bit and it can sound much more bittersweet. Now, as a little exercise, I want you to play up and down a very simple one octave C major scale. You can play it where you want, but I'm going to play it up here at the 15th fret on the A string. You can also play it down here at the 3rd fret or here at the 8th fret on the E string. Try different places because each place will have its own different sound and possibly coax a different feel from you. So now just play up and down it just like this. Okay. Now I want you to try playing it with a variation in the rhythm and the dynamics. So here I'll play up and down and give you a few demonstrations. Okay. Now let's try holding on several different notes. Now I'll try a few little melodic variations to prolong the ascent and the descent. I'll be going over some of these melodic devices in the upcoming lessons, but in the meantime just mess around and be as creative as possible. That was just a simple major scale that can sound like any kind of rudimentary exercise, but with a little experimentation it can start to become an expression of your own musicality. Now let's have a look at some pure improvisation. I said I wasn't going to show you any licks just yet, instead I'm going to try something a little bit different. When you play any type of melody, you actually play rhythm. A melody is into melody until those little pitch things are attached to some rhythms that allow us to perceive them moving through time. Without rhythm, music ceases to exist in our kind of four-dimensional time frame. So what I'm going to do is just get you improvising without having to worry about all those melodic intricacies that people often bring to the table right at the start. A beginner lesson can often involve learning, well, here are some chords, major 7, minor 7, dominant 7. You use the chord tones of each chord to play over them, so here's a major 7, minor 7 and dominant 7 arpeggio pattern. Okay, improvise. And if you're really unfortunate, you might just get a bunch of modes, like I want you to use a major or Ionian or even a Lydian scale over a major 7, a Dorian over a minor 7 and a Mixolydian over a dominant 7. Okay, go forth and improvise. And that doesn't really help a beginner, so as a teacher you're either going to get a blank expression or a bunch of scales or arpeggios played up and down through a chord progression like this. <laughs> And that's it. So I'm going to get down to the real basics and the real stripped down essence of improvisation by just using one note. Okay, so one note of a one chord. You really can't go wrong with that. And what we're going to do uh, is improvise with one note and see how creative we can be without all the preoccupation uh, with worrying about linking chords, voice leading, targeting, arpeggios, passing notes and closures, sequences and all that kind of stuff. So let's take an A7 chord. 
So this is a dominant seven chord, and to let you know, it's made up of the notes A, C sharp, E, and G. So if you've been following any of my music theory and chord construction series, you'll recognize it and know it by the following arpeggio pattern. Okay, so we have A, C sharp, E, G, and A. Or one, three, five, flat seven, and the octave. We could play down here. Or up here. They're all that A7 uh, pattern. Now, we're not going to worry about any of those chord tones just yet. We're just going to use the root note, A. So, find an A. I'm going to use this uh, A here at the 50, uh, 14th fret of the G string. And we're going to play it over the backing track and just try improvising some rhythms. So, here's an example. Okay, so this is actually more like drumming and I've got to say that listening to drum solos can actually be really helpful when it comes to improvising melodically because drummers can still create wonderful music with a limited tonal palette. So a few things to look out for when trying this kind of exercise is to think of the bigger picture and try to hear question and answer phrases. Um, I might start with a basic rhythmic phrase like this. Okay, now I might answer it with something like this. Question. Okay, so I've actually got two phrases going on there. I've got the question, and then I answer it. Okay, and then I can move on to something else. This type of question and answer phrasing can seem more obvious when you split the phrases between two octaves like this. We've got the, the A up there, we've got the A down here. Uh, if I play a question phrase, down. Try to think of elements other than pitch. We only have one note, so we've got to use other musical elements to sustain the interest. So the most obvious of these is rhythm. That's uh, the thing that you're probably most likely to mess with, so try different rhythms like triplets and try working around the beat and the bar lines instead of coming in on beat one or on the beat. So come in later, like this. Two, three, four, one. One. One, two. One, two. One. One. Three, four. Okay, so there, I wasn't coming in on the beat, I was working around the beats and I was coming in on the and of certain beats. Every phrase has a start point, a middle, and an end. A one note phrase still has all three because it has to start at some point, it sustains, and then it ends at a certain point in the bar. So try to bear this in mind and uh, start your phrases on different beats, play them for varying amounts of time, and always pay attention to the ending point, well, the start point and the end point of uh, various phrases. Get as odd or as common as you want. We're trying to experiment and get creative, so try anything that you feel like. Rhythm's a key element of style, and you'll find that all the big names, certainly the innovators, all have their own approach to rhythm and phrasing. Next, think of space. This exercise highlights space probably more than any other, because when you're down to just rhythm, it really highlights space as actual music material. For instance, this phrase is made up mainly of space. 
But it's still a phrase. So keep this in mind at all times because the opposing side to this is absolute rhythmic saturation like this. And that can get boring pretty quick. From a melodic standpoint that can end up sounding something like this. And again, that can be really boring, and even the most chromatically diverse line uh, can eventually become quite um, orally exhausting. It's actually the equivalent of talking like this with no breaks over and over until it becomes really boring and it doesn't matter what mappages are or whether the voice goes up or it goes down and around, it's still monotonous and incessant rhythm like this. Good for effect, but boring if that's all that you've got. Also try messing with other elements like dynamics and non-pitch uh, elements like ghost notes. Okay, so now we can make things a little bit more interesting by adding another chord tone into the proceedings. So first of all, let's have a look at uh, one fairly close to that root note of A in the 7th, which over an A7 is going to be the minor 7 or flat 7, which is a G. Okay, so I'm using this G 12th fret of the G string after using the 14th fret for the A. Okay, so let's just jump into uh, the uh, improvisation and just see what we come up with just with the G. Okay. Okay. The main thing to notice with this G is how it sounds against the chord and how it influences the way that we phrase. These two notes alone can help with understanding the concept of tension and release. In all tonal music we create musical phrases that play with the various tensions in a key. The tonic of a key like C in C major or A in A major has the least amount of tension and acts as a main point of resolution. If I play the A major scale up from this A, you can hear the G sharp wanting to resolve as we get to the top. Tension, release. So that's the tension and release that we're talking about, and every note has a varying degree of tension relative to any other note. You can also hear it in intervals and chords, uh, like this. So here we have a lot of tension. Not as much tension, but still a fair bit. Not that much tension. Uh, only a little tension. Okay, and very little tension with the unison or octave. The end of any musical phrase in melody or harmony is called a cadence, and this is the ideal place to mess with this concept of resolving or resolution. Just using the notes that we have already, I can start a phrase uh, on the root or that A, and then bring it down to the G, the seventh, and you can hear it hanging there and wanting to resolve back to the A. Okay, and it's more noticeable with the track. Okay, we're coming back to the home. Okay, back to the air. Okay. So try playing around with different cadence points and try to get a feel for how that seventh sounds. Every different pitch will have a certain sound or feel relative to, uh, to that dominant seven chord, the A7 in this uh, instance. And it's important to know how each of these notes work. So as a basic example, I can play a phrase over that A7 using the notes of this A7 arpeggio or A mixolydian scale. And if we finish on that G, it'll always have the same desired effect. Okay, so... 
It's like getting the last word in. <laughs> okay. In the same way, if I was to finish on the fifth of the uh, of the chord, this gets an E. Okay. So it always has that same kind of sound. Now I'll try landing on the third. Okay, so bearing this uh, concept of cadence in mind, we'll add another one of those notes to the overall improv practice, and this time we're going to add the fifth, okay? So over an A7, that's going to be an E, which I'm going to play up here at the 14th fret of the D string, okay? So now we have A, G, and E to choose from in the, uh, in the improv, okay? So, drag. I'll start with that E and milk it a little while. should be starting to get the idea by now of how this simplistic approach to uh, getting started with improv can work. We're thinking of the non-pitched bass parts of the music just as much as the notes because there's more diversity in these elements. As I said before, experiment with your start and end points. So here I've got a few examples. So let's say we go work from the root to the root, okay? Okay, so that's a simple phrase. So that's from the A back to the A. Root to the seventh. Okay, so root to the seventh. Now root to the fifth. Simple phrase. Now let's try ones from the seventh. So seventh to the root. Okay, seventh to the seventh. Another simple phrase. Seventh to the fifth. Now let's try from the fifth, so fifth up to the root. Fifth to the seventh. Fifth back to the fifth. Okay, all very, very simple little phrases, just experimenting with the start note and the end note. As I mentioned before, I'm sticking to this one position here uh, for the same reason that I had for starting with one note, and that's limiting. Now, limiting ourselves in practice is great, not only for getting started on a concept, but also for fine-tuning our playing and forcing us into making the most of the knowledge that we have with as few resources as possible. Okay, so now we can add the final chord tone of the third, which over an A7 is gonna be a C sharp, which I'm gonna play here at the 11th fret of the D string. Okay, so now we have the root A, G the seventh, E the fifth, and uh, C sharp the third. Okay, so let's just go for it with the uh, backing track, and I'll start by just milking this third for a bit so we can get an idea of how it sounds. Thank you. 
Okay. So now we've covered all four notes of the uh, A7 arpeggio, we can start to diversify by just bringing a few more of those chord tones in from around this area. So before, we were just sticking to the A, the G, the E, and the C sharp there in that octave. So now I'll bring in the lower A there, so the root at the 12th fret of the A string, bring in the G here at the 10th fret of the A string, the E down at the 12th fret of the E string, and the C sharp down at the 9th fret of the E string. So we have the 3rd C sharp, 5th E, 7th uh, the G, and then... Okay, and we could even just jump up for that C sharp up here on the G string as well. Okay. So now let's try improvising with some of those extra chord tones. So hopefully that's going to help you with thinking creatively and getting started with your improvisation. As with verbal language, it takes time to develop speech and vocabulary, so don't try to run before you can walk. Just start with the absolute basics, and if anything seems too difficult, just cut down even more. As you saw with that A7 chord, I broke it down to one note. If you can already play to a certain standard, don't let your pride and your ego get in the way of allowing yourself to become a beginner again in a topic that you're unfamiliar with. If you try to start at too high a level, then you'll just find that your progress is slower in the long run. So next time, I'll be adding some extra scale tones into this A7 chord and showing you how passing tones and uh, neighbor or auxiliary notes can be added to the phrases. Okay, so check out all my other lessons on uh, the YouTube channel and over at TalkingBass.net and subscribe to get updates on all my new lessons. I usually release two and at least one lesson per week, so look out for those. Also, please like this lesson and leave a comment if you have any questions or just nice things to say. Okay, see you later.